You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 80, discussing free market arbitration with Kevin Rose of EOS New York. Let's go. What's up, Liberty Nation, and welcome back to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash Oro, and today's guest is Kevin Rose. He is the co-founder of EOS New York, which is a block producer candidate for the EOS blockchain, as well as the head of community for EOS EOS New York. Uh, He's the guy on Twitter, managing the community, answering the questions, providing value for all of the stuff that is going on, all the conversations that are going on in all the channels. I don't think the guy sleeps. He's on social media more than I am, which is saying a lot. Kevin Rose, thank you so much for joining Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thanks for having me, Ash. So start us off by giving a brief background of who you are, how you got interested in blockchain, and what specifically got you so involved and passionate about EOS? Yeah. Uh, so, hey, everybody. Kevin here. Uh, and I am from uh, northeastern United States. Husband, father, squash player, if you know what that is, my favorite sport. Uh, and blockchain enthusiast and block producer candidate. Uh, and pretty late to the game compared to a lot of people. So it wasn't until early last year that Rick Schlesinger, co-founder of EOS New York and, and our head of operations and strategy, came to me and said, "This is you. you have to be looking at this. Stop, stop what you are doing and look at this uh, because blockchain is going to be, it is going to change the world and the way that we interact, transact and relate with each other. Uh, And I started to look at it and understood that it introduces trust into inherently mistrusted systems into um, with untrusted, untrusting parties. Uh, And then I, I just dove in head first. He he had introduced a lot of people uh, to it at that time, so he's getting questions left and right, right? And and I I just decided to become a student of it. So um, I traveled a lot for my my fiat mining gig, and I would just put on podcasts and um, YouTube uh, tutorials and videos and people talking about it and philosophizing about it. You know, I did about. 50 or 100 hours of just listening before I finally came back to him and said, okay, I have a couple questions for you. Um, and then and then we, we both got to EOS in, in, in the white paper and that sort of changed everything. And did he introduce you to EOS? Was EOS your first like introduction into the blockchain space or were you learning about other chains and coins? I was learning about just the idea of blockchain i felt that it was important not because i I saw very quickly that uh each each chain each network uh each token or coin had their own um unique attributes and i could probably get caught up learning just uh, just about bitcoin or just about ethereum or navcoin or v chain or whatever else was going on and i said i'd rather try to understand blockchain as a technology uh and what, what actually was really uh, fascinating was Unchained, the podcast with Laura Shin, where she would just talk about blockchain as it's used around the world, as it's being used now in real settings. Uh, uh, so EOS was not the first, um, it, but it, it certainly is the most important in my life right now. Yeah, back in you know early 2017, EOS didn't even exist yet. The I don't even know if the team was put together. I think it was still in the in the first initial stages of Dan, like figuring out what it was and getting, getting all the, all the cogs starting to turn. Yeah. Um, you know what? So let's, let's dive in. You know, anybody that keeps a uh, constant listen to this show knows that I recently put out a podcast with EOS 42 with David. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Dave. And, yep. And recently with Luke Stokes of EOS DAC and, so we're continuing this whole EOS trend. I'm super excited about the, the launch of the software as one of the main reasons I brought you on, Kevin. So previously, I've talked a lot about the mechanics of EOS and the mechanics of a block producer and technically how it works and the differences and similarities between the miners and the block producers. But today, I'd really like to focus with you on block producers as community leaders and block producers as a business. 
So let's start with black producers as a community leader, because I think that that's kind of a prerequisite right now. What I see with all these black producer candidates coming from around the world, you know, we have uh, EOS 42, we have EOS New York. I see EOS Denver and Australia and Sweden, all these, all these communities popping up. What, in your opinion, is the role of a block producer as a community leader specifically in this whole EOS like global community that's starting to, to rise out of kind of nothing? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I think that first we need to uh, sort of back up and say why, why is, a, is a block producer a community leader? And I think it's because, uh, it's because of the way incentives are aligned on the network. And you've probably heard this in one of your previous episodes, right? Uh, but being a community leader is one facet of a block producer because the block producer must always be adding value because the, the very life of a block producer depends on that fact. Uh, if it's not, if the block producer organization is not continuously adding value to, uh, to the network, then they're not doing their job. If they're not doing their job, um, there's no reason anyone would vote for them. So as, as a community leader, I think it makes perfect sense because, uh, it's just one aspect of why you would say why you would look at a block producer and say they're they're doing a good job at at adding value into the network, uh, and and it's it's community has a couple facets. It's it's uh, itself evangelizing or educating the token holders, right. um, engaging and and empowering developers. They're part of the community. Um, coordinating collaborating discussing with block producers they're part of the community and then there's this other part of the community and they just don't know they're part of the community yet is everybody else they're non-token holders and, and that so I, I those are the four categories uh, of community for me is um, token holders dap developers fellow block producers and everybody else on planet earth right uh, and and the block block producers job is to is to figure out how to reach um, all four yeah, and I know that some block producers are creating software um, to, to try to help the community, maybe a delegation software. Or, then some block producers are creating educational materials. Some of them are creating uh, podcasts like this. I'm not officially affiliated with any block producer. I'm just kind of a guy that gets to ask all the questions. But it, it seems like this parallels real life where people are, who want to grow and strengthen their community and if they have that skill set and that passion, then they come out and start building things to support their community. And this is something that I don't necessarily see on other chains. Yeah, we always have guys that, or girls that want to talk about the community, but they don't necessarily build for the community. What role do you think that block producers have in both educating and like building actual dApps that are going to run on the EOS chain that help users like feel not only part of the community, but interact and communicate with each other better. Yeah, I think that block producers should be doing that now um, because there, we, there may be a lot of people out there that are developing their own ideas. We just may not have heard from them yet, but if there are, if there aren't, I think block producers are uniquely positioned to to kickstart that conversation uh, as the network matures I, I don't know if we don't want to be looking to block producers to do everything mm -hmm. because it's not about them they're re they're really to um, empower people and and maintain and grow the network so I think it's the role of producers to um, connect those who have ideas with those who have uh, the development skills. And we do that through meetups right now, um, through setting up uh, online communities. EOS Talks does that. You know, you're doing that. Um, yeah, and I but see, yes. I see like producers like supporting conferences and stuff now as well. You know, I, I see the, ro I personally see the role of block producer is like setting the stage or like setting a precedent of the type of people we, we welcome into this community, the people that to have the vision aligned and who actively want to produce value, you know, leading with experience and leading with value. It, it's, it brings me to my second point here is like block producers as a business. And I know a lot of people don't like to think of this whole blockchain space is like, oh, I'm running this as a business because I think we still have some leftovers of 
oh, profit's bad and, you know, that requires trust. And, but the, one of the things I really appreciate about EOS is it's taking real life scenarios and trying to programmatically recreate that in the digital blockchain space. And whenever I learned that block producers were supposed to or encouraged to run as a business, you know, it really got me thinking like, wow, this is really free market aligned. Like, yeah. Wh what does it mean for a block producer to you to run as a business? And how are you positioning and creating your team specifically to run as a business and offer this block producer service to the community? Yeah, um, it, it absolutely is like running a business and it's the most complex one that I've ever been a part of when that includes, um, you know, representing brand communications for Fortune 500 automotive companies. Uh, just just the, the sh especially, this may just be in the United States, but the there's no clear regulatory guidelines just right there off the bat. So you need to figure out how can I go about doing this without the government kicking my door in? And you need to be able to um, treat it very methodically from, from the get-go. Uh, we're, we're currently still forming our, our business because we have spent a lot of time working with really good lawyers to figure out how we can protect um, the, the block producer's assets the, the node that we actually manage, you know, our contribution to the network and how do we protect ourselves too from, from government intervention and asset seizure. So uh, that's been a long road and that's been all, all um, you know, Rick, our co-founder, but running it as a business, um, it's, it's different in that, you know, we're not doing it to make profit. That's, that's kind of like, what is the point of a business it is to make profit? That, that's the basic definition, but it's not like this because if you were, if a block producer were running it only to make profit at the end of the quarter, the token holders are going to look at them and say, well, you know, we don't really know what's going on with your finances. You should, you should show us. And, and if they're, you, they need to demonstrate that they have, it's really the community's best interest is mine. The point of a block producer is to, sh is to, have the best interest of the network and the community in mind, not themselves. It's an interesting, it's a new thing. Yeah, it is a new thing because finally we have that feedback loop of the voting mechanism that's inherent in EOS and, and delegated proof of stake chains in general. Exactly. That, that makes the block producers, um, you know, it, it kind of holds their feet to the fire because if they're just in it to, to just make money and not to grow the community, then yeah, they're still offering a service, a, a really good service. They're inserting the, the transactions, they're securing the chain. But me as a token holder and as someone who plans on voting actively, I want to see the block producers who are running this as a sustainable business and who are looking outside of just doing their, their main uh, block producer role, at, you know, the, the technical role of a block producer. But are they trying to educate are they trying to create materials are they do they have a podcast are they hosting conferences are they building software now none of this stuff is required to be a block producer and there may right. be some block producers that get elected without doing this stuff but it's, there are there are some there are some block producers that are intentionally saying that they'll do absolutely nothing above a block production right. you know and, that, and that's that's the selling point so there's a whole bunch of different models yeah yeah, it's great that we finally have that full feedback loop that we can vote them in or, or vote them out uh, I see on your site, I see Rick here, head of strategy, you head of community, uh, William Deck, lead systems engineer, Mac, Mike Haggerty, uh, lead software engineer, just to give those guys some shout outs. Like, what have you guys learned over the past three or six months as you're trying to build your team together? What problems have you encountered or what, what types of roles are you, are you finding necessary and or you know, difficult to figure out for a team because you're, you, as you're building a business, everyone knows that it building a, a solid team is one of the most important aspects of it. Like how's the evolution been on the team or just like figuring out like how you guys are going to position yourself and who's going to fill those roles. Well, that's been probably the easiest and most organic part. Uh, if I were, there's, there have been four or five people, um, that have been very serious about becoming a block producer. And they asked me like, what it, how would, how do you form this? And I said, well, 
basically we have three pillars uh, of uh, of our disciplines and one is technology which is obviously the the basic and most important thing uh and buddy started that off then then there is having your business operations set up uh and then there is making sure that you understand the the needs and wants and and thoughts of the community so that you can best align your, your what what your goals are with what the community wants it's and that's that's perfectly aligned with what we do um, my background in communications buddy's background in systems administration and rick's background in um uh his his background in business and mergers and acquisitions and stuff and and then we brought on Mike as, as to fill in another role of, of uh, front-end software development. So we have an incredibly flat organization. There's, no, there's nobody in charge. We, every, every Monday we meet and we say, you know, let's remind ourselves what our goal is here. And then we all know what we're capable of and we go out and do it. Uh, and, and that's been the best part is no one questions each other's um, core competencies. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see the types of systems and teams that these block producers put together to try to build the uh, enough redundancy and enough trust, you know, in the community and in their system. I find it fascinating how the incentives are so aligned on the EOS environment that everybody is kind of working towards the same goal. Whereas on other chains like Bitcoin, for example, like what what incentives do I really truly have to run a full node or how do I feel like I'm part of the Bitcoin community whenever I'm just a token holder? Well, it's, it's, it's a much different uh, environment here with EOS because whenever you start putting the entrepreneurs first, then they're the ones building and supporting a community. Again, not that different than in the physical world, reality or whatever you want to call it, right? Not the digital space. We, the entrepreneurs are the people figuring out the problems and they're starting to solve those problems and they hire people and they manage systems. And it's just, it's just fascinating. I think, I think a lot of, a lot of it has to do with spheres of influence, range of influence, because as a, if you're a Bitcoin um, holder, you're, you're kind of a bystander. You're, you're not taking part. You could be online in a message board, but your words could just never be heard. Uh, and in in EOS, it's it's not it, the incentives are aligned, but you can you directly influence what's happening. Right. You you are participating. You are not uh, standing on the sidelines. I think that's what's made the you know you you've you've witnessed the community's passion firsthand. It's because everyone matters. Yeah. In it, every right. single person matters. Right. Yeah. I, they, it, you can't say that anywhere else. No, you really can't. I mean. Even in or like, sorry, everyone matters. I, I mean, like they they feel like they they matter well, they, as well. Yeah, they don't have that feedback loop that allows them that two way communication. Like with Bitcoin, all you can do is hold, send, and receive. I mean, yeah, you can right. run a, a node, but you know, why? Right? It's not like you can really change the protocol of Bitcoin. You you have almost no influence over um, code upgrades or who's who's protecting the network like the miners and stuff like that you don't yeah you just you wake up you read the news like oh are we forking today oh we're forking today cool yeah well what should i do now (laughs) crap i didn't even know this right right Um, or or what are my what are miners doing with their profits yeah do i like i i bet very few people even think about that because it's so outside the realm of what you'd have the ability to have influence over that you're just like that doesn't matter but now one of the biggest things the biggest topics in the community is you know what are these what are these block producers going to do with this with this money they're making right you know we 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 need transparency there and that's great that's going to be a great thing for for everybody that level of transparency yeah and and it's uh you know, i can base my votes off of that like if you're if you're building a school to help educate children on how blockchains can protect life liberty and property like that means a lot to me you're but, and and who are these bitcoin miners right who are these who's the face of these guys i mean and right. what what are they doing with their profits and how committed to our community or the bitcoin community are they you know this i i i have a saying um or i don't have a saying it's just something i say is that miners miners extract value and block producers add add value mm. that's i mean i i think that's going to hold really true once we see the network launch and um 
it's a it's a race. It really is a race between block producers to do the most good. I know uh, the fastest. It's yeah. a fantastic thing because they're they're they are directly held accountable by the voters, aka the token holders. And yeah. it's it's just something that you know Dan figured out um, back in in bit shares and then tweaked it for Steam and then tweaked it again for EOS, but. Even like the BitShares community, a project that didn't even close to reaching its potential. You know, as someone who built an offshore bank, I, whenever I found about BitShares, I was like, my goodness, you can create your own money here. It's got nearly, <laughs> nearly free, nearly tree tra free transactions. Like you can create derivatives of things. You can loan, you can create loans. I was like, it has its own, it, it's its own payment rail. It's like, why did this not you know, get big and, you know, yeah. for different reasons it hasn't, but, you know, I, I think we're doing it right this time or Dan's doing it right this time. You know, right. Let's, let's chat about the competitive nature versus cooperative nature in block producers. I mean, you're running a business and you're right. not, you're not outside of the free market forces of competition, but then you're also, or are you incentivized to work together in cooperation with other block producers or is it strictly dog eat dog? No, I, I think it's definitely not dog eat dog. It has been the most thing that I have ever been a part of. Uh, and it's very fascinating because I, I come from a very competitive world. I live in the New York City area. It's it's not the most like collaborative place. It's everybody out for themselves, you know. Uh, but but the, but when I when I started to to you know, when I started reading about EOS and, and listening to Brendan talk about an, aligning incentives and understanding what this is all about, you know, I thought, yeah, I have something to offer. I want to help. And none of us are as smart as all of us. So let's just, I'm just going to see who I can help and see what happens. And I think that everybody has done that. Yeah. You know, that's everyone has said individually, like, I'm just going to see how I can help. And together we've been able to create this this thing. But with with um, the block producer specifically, I I think it may be something in the back of the mind where everyone's like, at the end of the day, you know, you you have to, you still have to get voted in. But it's and then again, it may not be there because you wouldn't be able to tell from the actions. It almost doesn't matter because the the motivations are eclipsed by the actions of every block producer and they and they're always good everybody is helping everyone um i would say it's much more collaborative and if there is competition there you can't even sense it yeah N not yet you can't sense it for sure I not mean, yet yeah I, I think we will you know once once the the payments start coming in and the it, it looks more like a business than it does just got you know a community and people trying to help each other i think we will see that competitive nature start creeping in eventually but i, I hope that the way that all of this all these block producers and all these eos cities have an incentive to come together right now because they see the vision of this thing right. and and not not to compete because there really is no competition at the moment everybody's competing to build this community Right. If we were to, competing, to, to this, this wouldn't work. This yeah. would work. Right now, I don't think it would. You know, we're competing, but we're competing in the space of this blockchain-based operating system race that's happening between Cardano and Ethereum and EOS and NEO. And I don't even know if Stratus is still around, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's like we're trying to set ourselves apart. And the best way to do that at the moment is to bond together because we think we have a lot of the answers to problems that other chains are still struggling with specifically scalability. You know, let's chat about the whole scalability aspect of EOS and sure. how, how that's going to support uh, a community much larger than say Ethereum. Yeah. Uh, and, and for everyone listening, that's extremely technically inclined. Forgive me if I misspeak, because we, like I said before, we have our our core competencies, uh, and I am not a, a systems administrator or distributed systems engineer. Uh, but it, it it is amazing to me that you know when I first started getting into this and saw the massive fluctuations in price volatility and evaluations of these companies and um, networks, 
that none of them are actually usable. You can't, you can't, if everyone just tomorrow decided to use Bitcoin, all right, if everybody goes, all right, we're done with government money, we're just going to use Bitcoin, yeah. it would, it would literally fail. Yeah. <laughs> tomorrow. And, and so would every single other one with, with the exception of <laughs> BitShares' team it really right now, they could, they could hang on for a while. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's not only the ability to have high throughput that is uh, the, the measure of the, the scalability potential of the network. But it's also, as we, if we are a village of 15 people, we can very easily figure out how to get along and everyone live happily and together and contribute. When we grow in size, there's going to be a critical mass where if we do not have a proper uh, if we do not have a proper code in the way that we treat each other, rules that we follow, a system of governments, it will collapse into chaos, into who uh, has, who is the loudest or who has the most hash power. I mean, that's, that's what we are actually seeing. So it's scalability and throughput, the technologies there. On the test net, we hit 600 transactions per second a couple months ago with just, you know, free instances of Linux on AWS and some you know, garage uh, servers, that's already faster than Bitcoin on a on a on an alpha product uh, a month ago. But it's also Thomas uh, Cox, blockchain governance expert, releasing his drafts of the Constitution, um, and it's like one that he dropped today, which was that no token holder or group of interest can hold more than ten percent of issued tokens. Right. That's that's a big thing that will affect now, and it will affect ten years from now. Mm. Uh, you know, avoiding that Pareto effect of of, of concentrating uh, wealth into a, a couple hands. So it's definitely it's throughput, it's governance, and and that's where EOS sets itself apart. We're really in both. Yeah, I mean, not only can EOS and like you said, Steam and BitShares delegate proof of stake systems, but we're specifically talking about EOS here. Not only can it technically handle like mass adoption, but it can. I hope and I think that the governance layer and the, the ideas being put forth on how to incorporate a governance layer in EOS can also handle mass adoption. I mean, because let's face it, if you have an issue with someone you did business with in Bitcoin, who do you turn to, right? If you, if you, sent, if you sent your Bitcoin for, let's say you wanted to buy something, who, who do you turn to? There's, Bit, there's... Bitcoin, Bit, Bitcoin ignores, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, Bitcoin ignores basic time old property rights. It completely ignores it. If you have, if you have my private key, you own my Bitcoin now. But if I, if I'm, let's say I'm going to a parking garage and I, and I, um, I heard this example the other day, I thought it was perfectly concise. If I hand my car keys to the, to the guy to go grab my car, he doesn't own my car right. simply because he has my car keys. But in Bitcoin, if you own or if you have the private key, you own those coins. That's it. It's over. So yeah. right there, the, the very oldest maximum of property rights are, are gone. So what kind of future is that? Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's astonishing to me that more people haven't discussed or even brought up the need for a free market in governance and a free market in blockchain based arbitration, because in the traditional world, governments, governments have had a monopoly on the justice system and the legal system forever. But I can remember listening to Robert P. Murphy back, man, it must be six years ago or so now. He's a, a fellow at the Mises Institute in Auburn, mm. Alabama, but he was giving presentations on a free market for law and the free market for law enforcement, because there's two parts there. You need to be able to construct law in a free market sense, and then you have to enforce law in a free market sense. And we want, we want competition in the most fundamental and basic aspects of human life, money and, and arbitration and you know, stuff like this, but education, you, you know what you know what it screams to me in those examples is you have you have reputation and accountability. Yeah. 
that's in 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 any kind of public um, public endeavor, you don't have much of that accountability. You certainly don't have reputation. Uh, that to me is the biggest difference. Yeah, and, and this is something that you know, Block One and and Dan specifically, and give a shout out to Thomas Cox because I know and I appreciate all the work he's putting into this, and just like thinking through this stuff and figuring it out and like, what do we need? to not just build a blockchain for money or for dApps, but build a blockchain that supports a community for the next hundred years. And right. that's not Bitcoin because you don't have any way to like settle your differences. And that's why we see all these forks in Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash being the most notable. Bitcoin, that is literally how they settle their differences. They settle differences by coming in with the, the club of hash power and they bang it onto the blockchain and they splinter the community in various parts and weaken it mm -hmm. every time they fork. And this is how they settle their differences. I mean, we don't live in a cave, but I feel like Bitcoin and, is a cave, is a caveman, is, is the cave that these cavemen are living in. And, and that's going to be, um, this is where I think EOS gets pretty controversial because it's, I think everybody right now, everyone has a hard time visualizing what does an arbitration system look like that mm -hmm. is cross border it somehow on chain, do, is there a pool of arbitrators ready to go? Do they do they know about EOS? I'm going to have to explain this to everyone. Or um, the the fact is that arbitration is a, a nearly universally recognized form of dispute resolution across the world. Over 140 countries recognize it as legally binding. Um, so my my in, the way that I imagine this is uh, is not that there is going to be EOS arbitrators but that it's really open to any arbitrator that uh, is qualified. Right. Uh, I don't know exactly how it's going to work because there are a couple other things, maybe some worker proposals that need to empower arbitrators as well. Um, and, and, and these are just, these are just my ideas. Uh, I'm still trying to figure them all out, but for example, people say, well, um, if, if the, if I get, a thief makes off with my coin, my tokens and liquidates them. And now, now what do I do? Um, well, there has been discussion, you know, Ian Grigg has mentioned this a bunch of times of having uh, the arbitration forum have access to an insurance fund that they could allocate at their discretion to essentially make you whole. Right. Uh, or, or, it, that that but that kind of sounds maybe like a public if the insurance fund is uh funded through inflation maybe that's a little more it's too public mm. it it's, it sounds more like a, a governmental operation what if there were private insurance companies right. that did exactly that thing for sure i don't know and, and and you sign up for an arbitration insurance company you know just like you would buy health insurance of course this would be all voluntary but it would protect you against fraud and stuff like that if yeah. somebody came in and stole your keys, well, you would make an appeal to your insurance company and they would take a look at it and they would see if, oh, did your neighbor steal your keys because you're in cahoots or is this like a legitimate theft instance where, yeah, we're going to either wholly or partially re-reward you, make you whole again from what was thieved from you. This, I mean, this is stuff like Dan said, the thing, the, the questions and problems that EOS and the team have, are figuring out or have figured out are questions that other teams and blockchains haven't even thought of yet. And I really love that quote from him the other day. And you know, I, 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 pushed, I had pushed back and I was quite vocal on Twitter. And I know this, this interview is not about me, but I pushed back a lot on Twitter and in the Telegram groups about the decisions to either make these arbitrators paid for by inflation and voted upon by the stakeholders versus having a truly free market arbitration and law system. And I, I hope that some of my questions have influenced the, the thoughts of having a free market in the legal system, whereas like you said, anyone can be an arbitrator. That's not saying that they will be or they'll be hired as arbitrators, but this is a very serious role. At the end of the day, we are reevaluating and restructuring the rule of law in a free yeah. market sense. And just walk me through your, your mindset, because I know that you're very active in Twitter on Twitter and in these telegram groups. Like what has been your mindset of either voting for these arbitrators and arbitrators uh, for the audience? They're basically just like judges. They're the people that you go to and 
they, they hear both sides and they make a ruling on what they feel like is the truth and the right thing to do um, from their experience. But what has been your mindset evolution on how the arbitrator specifically should be used or selected? Well, first, I think that um, anyone who wants to l think about how this might turn out should go look at how arbitration is working in the real world. And I, I'm still doing that. Um, I've never been in arbitration and I have never been an, arbitra uh, an arbitrator. <laughs> right. So, yeah. And, and hopefully never need to. Hold on. I'm just going to plug this in real quick. It's better than shutting off in the middle of a sentence. All right. Um, yeah, I I, th I would say that that y you definitely were a part of of my evolution in in your questioning of of is this a is this a free market solution or is this something that is funded where you can sit back as an arbitrator and go ah, I've got this pool behind me I don't really need to be accountable and put my reputation on the line. Um, one one thing was originally I thought that it would be a, a group of EOS arbitrators. So we've got this international network and there would be, I don't know, 250, let's just say. They're right. available all right. the time. And, and then I thought, wait, why do they have to be EOS arbitrators? This is, this is a system that's recognized across countries. People are trained in it. Why can't I just go down the street to an arbitrator and, you know, he's still a professional. He or she is still a professional. Right. It's not like they're not qualified to issue a ruling as long as they have all the facts and everything. Um, but I think uh, personally, I need to learn more about um, the consent of parties when it comes to arbitration, because you can, there's many different rules of arbitration. And when, if you and I have a contract at the, at the point of that contract, we agree on which, which jurisdiction, like which set of rules for arbitration we'll have. Uh, and we can even agree on if you choose it or I choose it or neither of us choose it or we both agree on who we pick. Um, so I'm still learning about a lot of that. Uh, but in, to switch topics a little bit, arbitration sort of opens the door up to some really controversial stuff when it comes to blockchain and EOS, which is, let's say you get a ruling. Now, what do you do with that ruling? You bring it to block producers. Right. And the block producer has to respect that ruling and uh, forge transactions. And when I say forge, I just mean create like, like a blacksmith forges a sword, not forge like uh, signatures. Right. Yeah, not falsify. They forge a transaction to execute on however the arbitrators have adjudicated. So that could involve damages, um, transactions that in effect would reverse other transactions such right. as theft. Uh, and that's where... Now, you know, people will question, well, is EOS immutable? Yes, EOS is immutable. The blockchain is immutable. But um, the, your actions are not. Right. If, if, you have, if, if you have taken control of my private key and all the other fail-safes that, fail that EOS has built in fail, um, I, I can reverse that and I can do it with arbitration. Um, and and, no, and as, a, as a block producer candidate, I'm, we will never... We don't want to evaluate them, all right? That kind of violates the integrity of an arbitration ruling if a block producer goes, yeah, I, I, hold on, I'll execute on this, but I want to read it first. It's like, yeah, we, yeah you, we'll read it's it to know what we power. need to do. I mean, it, it, right. it's, it, it's a lot of power. And, you know, having the only way that I'm comfortable with EOS, having, giving the block producers the power to basically sign a transaction on anyone's behalf, you know, this is very different than in other chains and just kind of the history of blockchain in general, whereas if you have your private keys, no one else can sign for you. Well, in EOS, there is the technical ability for block producers to sign on your behalf. And that's going to get a lot of pushback once this becomes more common knowledge. But and it's shocking. It's shocking at first, but we have yeah. we have reputation. Right. And we have accountability and we have block producers run as a business right. in that we have, we have stake in the game. This is, this is not, a, this is my job. Right. Yeah. And, and this is my career for sure. And with a free market in arbitration, that gives me the confidence that this will have enough checks and balances and a reputation system to manage something like this, this, this power, you know, adequately.
and respectfully. Mm-hmm. But, but because, you know, again, this is a lot of people, a lot of Bitcoiners that I talk to about this see this as the antithesis of blockchain. But I think that they're so caught up in theoretical land and not in practical land to understand like, hey, we're trying to replicate the, the real world out here and how things work in arbitration and in you know rulings and stuff like that. We're trying to do our best to figure out how to replicate that. But instead of having a government monopoly on how this works, now we're entrusting our community, our reputation system, and the free market feedback mechanisms you know, the forces of the free market to manage this for us. And mm-hmm. yeah, I, I am comfortable with this idea now that I understand that the, the arbitrators aren't going to be voted upon because I, I know that some people like Fuzzy were talking about, hey, we should have term limits. Well, no, we don't want term limits because that guarantees a spot. I want these arbitrators waking up every single day thinking, I've got to go out here. Nothing is guaranteed. I need to please my customers. I, I need to show that I'm a reputable person and that my rulings are consistent with my, my moral beliefs and they need to compete every single day. And there's, there's no lame duck period for these arbitrators. Oh, I just got voted in for four more years. You know, right. now, now it's six months left and I don't plan on trying to get reelected. I'm going to screw over people or just be lazy or whatever. We can't. It's every hundred or well, not for yeah. arbitrators, but it, it, Block produces every 126 seconds. Yeah, exactly. That's every, that's that's our lifespan from now on. Right. 126 seconds is the lifespan of that, block that's, that's your guarantee, right? 126 yeah. seconds is not a lot. It's not a long time. So you know, I, I want voting to be done in as few places as possible. Block producers make sense, but mm-hmm. arbitra- arbitrators doesn't really make that much sense to me. And, and I, I think that having an arbitration and legal layer on top of EOS is going to support a lot more enterprise. You know, I, I truly think that EOS is the chain that's going to support wide scale adoption of entrepreneurs, businesses, dApps, and enterprise specifically, because they yeah. feel like they have somebody to turn to. And I'm, I'm really excited, and this is like me nerding out a bit as an anarcho-capitalist, but I'm really excited to see the governance aspect of EOS be built out um, specifically around insurance companies. You know, insurance companies have been demonized uh, by people in in, the, in a capitalist society uh, because they don't treat us very well. Well, they don't treat us very well because they're so highly regulated by the government and they have right. basic monopolies. And we're right. forced to buy health insurance, for instance. Well, there's no free market feedback there when you're forced to buy a product that someone serves. I'm really, I'm really curious about how insurance companies have our backs and and maybe we maybe before you and I Kevin maybe before we do business with each other we spend two dollars and we buy a smart contract that was created by an insurance company that they're like okay use our smart contract to do business together and we'll insure it right we'll ensure that everything goes well not only that not only that we do we do two things one we have the smart contract that will serve as this automatic escrow without any third party right it receives the funds and you see that the funds are there and you can i don't know input Ship a tracking product. code right you put the tracking code it recognizes it it hooks up into the fedex api and sees that it's there and then it releases the funds to you and that's really cool but we can also have a Ricardian contract, because what what smart contracts don't do is they do not understand intent, right? They're just they're just kind of, they're just robots kind of, of contracts. Right. Yeah, the, the cold hard unfeeling. Just I, I only do what I'm told. But Ricardian contract or the concept of a of a machine parsable human readable contract. It, it's just it's it's pretty much a normal contract, right? That that uh, uh, that a computer can read. A system can read, and then every transaction that is broadcast under the the um, the governance of that contract contains a hash of that contract, and that's every single transaction on EOS will have the hash of the Constitution, which would be a Ricardian contract. So you and I can have one, and have the smart contract to govern the dynamic space of our transaction, but the static space, the intent, is is all written there. And I think it's it's a fascinating thing. Yeah, it is fascinating, and and. These contracts are going to be created by companies, most likely you know insurance companies, because they're going to be the ones backing these contracts and on the hook to pay out. But we're going to truly see 
how insurance companies like are, are this basically like this liquid kind of like oil in a machine in an engine that helps everything just work better and it's going to the purpose of insurance is to reduce risk you know the whole idea about you know back in the obamacare thing and i won't get on any political right here but they're talking about um you know pre-existing conditions well that that's that's the antithesis of what insurance is developed as insurance is, was developed yeah. as a free market tool to try to help you hedge risk and i'm really excited to see just that one small aspect of es and how it supports again coming back supporting the community which is you know it's i think it's going to change people's opinions on what insurance is able to do for us as a society and i'm again we I'll, should, I'll, you should check out uh Erio, um yeah. is a i think it's a Czech company and i should know that and i hope they don't hear me say that if i'm wrong <laughs> uh but they're they're using um they're using eos to put to try to put healthcare records on the blockchain. So that would be the f kind of the first step if you wanted to have uh, healthcare insurance on there. And and that's the same story, um, you know, nearly everything that's good put, get, that gets put on the blockchain is that it puts you, the 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 person that the records are actually about, at the center of it. You know, th th that's what that's what we're all all doing here anyway is is we're trying to put the individual at, at, or the value creator in any equation at the very very uh, nucleus. Yeah. Um, so let's chat about um, the launch and what you guys are doing to prepare. Oh man, <laughs> for the launch because it's like I don't know. I'm in Asia. I think it might be 45 or less days now until the yeah. code the code is available. The EOS the IO code is available, and who knows how many chains are going to be brought into existence. You know, I I, I saw the other day that. The Wax team, which I believe is one of the top hundred coins by market cap, they yeah, are ninety. Yeah, they're yeah. take they're taking the EOS code and changing it a bit, and they plan on launching their own blockchain, not too dissimilar to how Linux was created. You know, I, I went to college in the early two thousands and really saw Linux starting to bloom and how people would download the source code, change it a little bit, then upload Mint Linux or Ubuntu Linux or Fedora Linux, and this is what's happening with EOS. What are your what are your main concerns about the launch, and what are your main concerns about like just getting yourselves and the the EOS New York team ready to support these chains in these communities? A big concern that's happening uh, now is uh, well, a concern that community has uh, has had all along because because I read it every day is they're worried about collusion between block producers. They're worried about a cartel forming. Um, we see, we see, we see that stuff every day, and I think many block producers right now, because because everyone's reputation is so fragile right now, it re no one has suffered a catastrophic blow to their reputation, uh, and it will only take one big thing, and it's it's over. Uh, so everyone's really afraid of that. So it's very difficult to. Uh, we need to organize. Block producers need to organize, and there are certain functions of security that we need to discuss in absolute private. Um, you know, we, and we've we've been trying to figure out well, how will block producers talk to talk to each other, um, not necessarily with words, but like our systems communicating um, once once this network is launched. So we've we've been held up in organizing, and we've actually approached EOS Go. Um, and Kevin Wilcox and crew to say, we need your help in organizing because we want to do this in the most transparent way possible. Um, help us come up with randomized lists of block producer candidates that you've received. Divide us into groups. You know, we've got we we've got um, Thomas Cox's BIOS blueprint over here that says groups of 50. So get as close to that as possible, and let's start running drills mm -hmm. because everybody needs to be very uh, technically proficient at running the BIOS um, when, that, when that happens, uh, the network will be attacked when it launches. Yep. Not, it's, not, it's not if, uh, it, is, it is going to happen. We expect it that it's going to happen. Um, and so there's this interesting thing where we wanna be transparent and not look like we're colluding behind closed doors, uh, but also we need to get in gear um, and, start, and start preparing. And have a so launch really, plan, exactly. 
Right. So, and, and you know, there's a couple, there's a couple people that are doing tremendous work um, right now. Um, Alexandra from EOS Canada is, is writing the BIOS boot process, like wow. uh, almost by himself with, with, a, there is a group, but he, I mean, he is taking that head on. Um, there really is a lot of things that are being left to the community to do. Block one was not kidding. Um, the community is launching the network. So we're, I think that things are going to ramp up rapidly in the next 45 days. Man, and I feel uh, like they've ramped up rapidly in the past two months. Like all of a sudden, <laughs> you, you see a hundred block producer candidates contacting EOS Go. You see EOS City names popping up everywhere. It seems like I get, yeah. you know, five new EOS cities adding me on, on Twitter every day. And I'm like, wow, there's EOS in Dallas. And the community is just self organizing, which, you know, we all knew was possible. But yeah, I hear you, man. But there's a lot of vested interest in EOS not succeeding, right? Spe especially with the types of claims that they're making and the, the types of the type of confidence that Dan has in the software. And confidence is one way to describe it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I look forward to seeing and and hopefully participating in continuing to think through this stuff with you guys because we need a successful launch and a successful launch yeah. while, while we have this competition, it's like putting that to the side for now, because there's nothing to compete on if we don't cooperatively launch this thing. And yeah. I think a lot of people don't understand that the community is literally launching this. Um, I mean, 50 sounds like a good number, but even to me, it sounds like too many block producers. I mean, I, I hope you guys, you know how, how Bruce Fenton puts the Satoshi Roundtable together, you know, and, and that's not specific towards any blockchain, but I, I really hope that the EOS block producers put something together like that prior to the launch. And so you guys, some of you guys can meet in person and like hash out some of this stuff. Yeah, we're, we're um, you know, we're, we're thinking about doing that. Uh, there is, there is a, there's a conference that's like right after launch, which is unfortunately timed. Um, but may, maybe, maybe it's still possible, uh, to go. And then we, you know, we're, we have our roadmap and we're, we're planning a, a summit. We, we would like to plan a summit with many block producers in the Q, in Q1 of 2019, somewhere, uh, possibly in Europe kind of between, um, or, or just anywhere where everybody can get too easy because we have to consider where everybody is in, in East Asia and Europe, mm -hmm. South America, Africa, North America. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if everyone's going to get together face to face. Yeah. I don't think that's actually going to happen. Yeah. I think that everybody's going to do it remotely. Um, yeah. And, and, and I mean, I, I literally asked Kevin and EOS go today please, please give us lists so that we can sort of have the community's blessing to, to organize this. Yeah. Nobody cool. wants to seem like they're, they're colluding or, or leaving anyone out. Right. Oh, I will say, Kevin, that you guys in EOS, EOS New York are, in my opinion, the most prominent block producer candidate. You are you. on social media, answering questions, um, constantly creating content, which really matters to me. And you just, I can tell that you guys and you specifically really care about a successful launch and just having, having a structure put in place to build a reputation and not just seem like these guys that are trying to produce blocks and get paid for it. So I really appreciate you know, what, what you and your team are doing. Uh, I, always, I see you in every Telegram group that I'm in, be it you know, on Twitter, on, on Telegram or on Facebook. You're, I don't know when you sleep, but I hope that you can find some time. <laughs> it's the first, excuse me. Um, in, you know, I talk with a lot of people in China and I pretty much have the, from the hours of, you know, eight to, I go to bed at like nine 30 because my daughter wakes me up at six or pretty much yesterday I went to bed at eight 30, but I, I'm talking with people from China from like 8.30 to 9.30, 8 to 9.30. I'm talking with you in Bali from right now at 8.30. And then when I wake up from like, you know, 6.30 to 7.30 talking with people from China and then that's it. I, I don't get to talk to them again. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's all day. Um, but, but in Telegram, 
when I when I first started to join channels, uh, I didn't really say anything. I just asked questions, right? Because there Smart. were you know, <laughs> Michael Yeats is uh, just a fi- a, a figure boss. of the community. Yeah, yeah, incredibly knowledgeable, and 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 has personally taught me a lot. Um, and so thank thank you to him. Uh, but just listening and and learning from Ian Grigg. Mm-hmm. The fact the fact that we the, it, the people in the governance channel have access to a guy like that, um, financial cryptographer, of 15 years he, or, or more. Sorry, the the inventor of the concept of the Ricardian contract mm. um, as a legally bi- binding blockchain contract. There's an there's a, are, there are amazing people that are just in chat rooms available to to everybody. It's, it's insane. It's, it's amazing. The, the smartest minds in crypto, in my opinion, are in EOS and figuring this stuff out. Um, again, Kevin, just thank you a lot for the support that you give to this community. Uh, I mean, I, I for sure will be voting for you guys. Um, thank I, you. I, I recommend my listeners to take a closer look at what EOS New York is up to, what you stand for. Um, I look forward to a constitution coming out from, from the EOS New York team, like the EOS 42 team put out recently. I thought that, that was you know, a really strong aspect of who they are and what they stand for. And I I support you guys however I can. Um, Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? Anything you'd like to, any shout outs or any words of of wisdom or to the other block producer candidates while we move into the home stretch here and try to have a successful launch? Uh, Yeah, I think every, every block producer candidate that is working to build up the community doing the right thing and uh, they're doing it their, uh, the way they believe it should be done, all, all their own way. There's many different models, and that's exactly how it should be. There should be different ways that we do this. Um, and I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to every single one of them um, that be, because none of us are as smart as all of us, and we can't, no one can launch this alone. Um, and I think that it's, it's definitely time, there was a time to, to say intention. And there was a now. There's a time for action, right? So you know, we we have announced things like the EOS Resource Planner. You know, how many EOS do you need to power your idea? Things like that. We're getting that ready for launch. Like now, now we 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 can't talk about it anymore. We just have to go do it, uh, and we and we've been doing it. So that's that's the it's now the time for action. Uh, it's not the time for for promises anymore. And how can my audience keep up with the EOS New York team? Uh, on social media and possibly yourself as well. I, I know that there's a uh, at EOS New York on Steam and EOS New York. is your website. Any other ways? Um, yeah, you can join our Telegram group, uh, which is EOS New York Chat. Uh, there's um, there's actually if you'd like to join any Telegram groups, we put together a uh, just a resource list of like as many Telegram groups that I'm in. Every time I find a new one, I add it to the list. Um, Twitter EOS New York. Steam it, Medium, website, it's all EOS New York, uh, Reddit, use, tag me, use your EOS New York, and I'll try to come answer questions or, you know, wherever. Awesome. Put, it, put out the EOS New York bat signal, we'll come running. <laughs> well, Kevin Rose, you're absolutely a Liberty entrepreneur. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, let me know how I can help you guys out. And we're about 45 days and counting. So uh, good luck to you and all the other EOS block producers. I really look forward to seeing how this all develops out and, you know, strength and community. So thank you so much for coming on the Liberty Entrepreneurs podcast. Uh, to everyone else, until next time, keep building freedom.